Hello, this is Chuck Ridgway, Automation Technology Manager at Horner. Thanks for joining us for another Tuesday live stream. Well, if you can't tell, I'm in a really good mood. I've just come off a couple of vacations and I've had a chance to work on a really fun application that I'm going to share with you today, which is using the Banner GPS receiver with Horner OCS. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what the heck? What are you going to use a GPS receiver for in a PLC application or a Horner OCS application? You just can't see the utility uh, in using a GPS in, with those equipment, the equipment like an OCS or a PLC. Well, let me tell you, there are plenty of applications and use cases where a GPS can be darned useful. So we're going to review those today. Now, even though he couldn't join me for the open, Casey Gardner is standing by to answer any questions you might have. If you're watching live, just give us those questions in the chat section. And if you're watching on replay, then just give us those comments and questions in the comment section and we'll get back to you just as soon as we can. All right, let's take a look at how we're breaking down today's topic. Okay, we're going to answer the question, of course, what is the Banner GPS receiver, how it interfaces with the OCS. We'll talk about some of those applications where it has a lot of usefulness. Then we'll dive right into configuration in Seascape. We'll talk about some of the data manipulation you need to do in Seascape after you've received the data over Modbus. And there'll be plenty of demonstrations as we try to do anytime we have a live stream. Okay, so what is the Banner GPS receiver? Well, it is a handy accessory manufactured by Banner Engineering, which can be used to receive the following data via satellite. You can receive positional data such as latitude and longitude. You can receive altitude data. You can receive speed and direction if it is an application where you want this data while you're in motion. So there's plenty of great information available from the GPS receiver. And there's also some diagnostic information you can receive as well, so you can be confident in the quality of the data you're receiving from satellite. Okay, so that really is what the Banner GPS receiver is all about from a data standpoint. Now, from a specification standpoint, the Banner receiver is designed to be used outdoors because it needs to have a clear path to the sky so it can synchronize with satellites. It's got an IP rating of IP69K, a very wide temperature range from minus 40 all the way up to 80C. Now it has very flexible power supply requirements and that's important because a lot of outdoor applications are also 12 volt DC applications. Not all of them, but quite a few are. So both the OCS and the Banner GPS could be used at 12 volt DC for instance. Now from a connectivity standpoint, you can purchase it with a sealed M12 connector, or you can get it with flying leads. Depending on how your application needs to be installed, you would choose one or the other. And then from an accuracy standpoint, it will give you positional accuracy all the way down to two and a half meters. Of course, provided that you're synchronized with enough satellites that your data can be of that precision. So how does this GPS receiver interface with OCS? Now the OCS actually has a couple different ways it can interface with GPS type devices. Some GPS devices have what's called an NMEA output, which is a protocol used in the marine industry. And some GPSs have that output and the OCS does support that protocol as one of our standard downloadable protocols. However, the banner unit uses industry standard Modbus RTU as its protocol. And so that's how you would interface it with the Horner OCS. You can see the default Modbus settings there on the screen and all the GPS data or all the data we're going to be retrieving from the GPS is all mapped to Modbus holding registers. Now let's just take a really quick look at a snippet or a snapshot of the GPS Modbus map. And you can see that you actually have a couple different choices in terms of the format of the data that you receive, the main data I'm talking about, latitude, longitude, altitudes, uh, time and date. So you can choose to receive that data from the GPS unit in signed double integer format, 
or you can choose to receive it in floating point format. And we're gonna dive into this in a little more detail a little bit later, but this is, as I said, a snippet of the Modbus map. And one note I wanna make at this stage, and that is in the banner documentation, the Modbus register numbers that they list in the table does not have 40,000 added to it. So in other words, traditionally Modbus holding registers start at 40,001. So if you look on that chart, you'll see Modbus register one is one of the addresses listed there. It really refers to 40,001. So everywhere on that table in the banner documentation, you'll need to add 40,000 if you want the actual Modbus holding register. So now let's talk about different applications. Why would you ever want to use a GPS receiver with a Horner OCS? What sort of applications are we talking about? Well, from a market standpoint, we're typically talking about the mobile equipment market, maybe doing asset management for machinery that gets moved around the country. Very often it could be used in the agriculture industry. It can be used for building management. If you have, let's say an outdoor campus of any size to deal with, with you know outdoor equipment and those sorts of things. But the types of things you can do with the GPS, first of all, it's great for tracking assets. So again, any scenario where you've got equipment that's gonna be deployed in different locations at different times. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have a water reclamation piece of gear and that this piece of gear, or, or maybe it's a skid-based machine, it could get moved to a site and it could be there for months and then it's gonna be moved to a different site. So if you utilize the GPS component in that system with a Horner OCS, now at any given moment in time, you can see at a glance where all your different water reclamation machinery is located because that equipment is receiving its GPS information. And then you could use a communications network of some sort, whether it's cellular, whether it's a local LAN or local WAN, whatever the case may be, to report that information back to headquarters. So that can be really useful for keeping track of machinery that moves around a bit. Now, let's talk about how the GPS time could be useful. Let's say you have an application. It could be water reclamation. It could be one of those portable cement plants that you see cropping up all over the place whenever they're doing a big construction project. Well, maybe you have a series of these pieces of equipment located all over the country, and you'd like to do local data logging to be able to monitor the efficiency and some of the process parameters and those sorts of things of the equipment. And you'd like to be able to compare data logs from unit to unit you know, over time. And if you're using GPS time for each of these pieces of equipment, now you can put side-by-side -side data logs taken from the separate pieces of gear because they've all been synchronized to the same GPS time. So you know a data log with a timestamp that matches another timestamp from another piece of equipment thousands of miles away from each other, you know because they're both synchronized to GPS that that uh, data was gathered at the same time. So just a couple of examples of how having a piece or having a GPS receiver can be really useful in certain applications. Okay, now let's talking about connecting the OCS to the GPS itself. Well, because we're talking Modbus we, and we're talking Modbus RTU, in this case, the OCS is gonna act as the Modbus master and the GPS is gonna act as the Modbus slave. All right, so there's gonna be a cable that needs to be connected and we're talking RS-485, so we're talking about a plus signal and a minus signal. Now we could also be talking about a common signal, because remember when we're doing RS-485, we typically want to have three conductors, plus, minus for the COM pair, and then a common signal so that we don't have any common mode issues between devices. Now, we don't have to specifically run or specifically connect the common on the MJ2 port or the OCS serial port as long as we're using the same DC power supply for both the GPS unit and the Horner OCS unit. So we're looking at just two conductors between the GPS and MJ2 of the Horner OCS. And then of course, two conductors are going from the DC power supply to power the GPS unit. And of course, the OCS also has to be powered as well, but that's not through the serial port. Okay, and then from a configuration standpoint, now I'm gonna show this all to you in a demonstration. 
but from a configuration standpoint, you're really just configuring the OCS as a Modbus master over a serial port. Now it could be MJ2, that's what you're gonna find most often. It could also be MJ3 if you have a OCS with three serial ports. So it doesn't have to be MJ2. But you're gonna configure the standard serial port parameters, 19.2 and 8.1. You're gonna set the GPS slave as Modbus ID number one. You're gonna use Modbus five digit addressing. And then you're gonna set up a scan list to have the OCS just read data from the GPS unit. It's all read only data. The OCS will not be writing to the GPS unit at all. And you'll find, again, a couple different formats for the main data of longitude, latitude, altitude, time, and date. Again, you can choose between sign double integer format or floating point format. And then you've got plenty of other data you can read as well if you're interested in it, including speed and direction if you have a moving application where you want to be taking data while you're moving. And then, of course, a variety of different registers that you can read, Modbus holding registers you can read to give you a fix on how accurate the data is you're receiving based on how many satellites are currently synchronized, as well as some precision data as well. All right, let's move on to the tricky part of the application, and that is the data manipulation that we need to do. Okay, so all the data that we're going to be reading from the GPS receiver ultimately is 32-bit data, either in a floating point format or a signed double integer format. Now, I've got that snippet from the Modbus map as, as it is published in the GPS documentation. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the high word of the 32-bit data gets sent in the first Modbus address and the low word of the 32-bit data gets sent in the second Modbus address. And that is reverse of what the OCS is expecting, both in its register table as well as its double integer or floating point variables as used in variable-based advanced ladder. So that means we're going to have to swap those words at some point in order for the data to be interpreted properly. And there's a couple different ways we can do that. We can either do that in the Modbus scanner or we can do that in logic. And we'll go through both approaches. Now, one other note on the data we're receiving in from the Banner GPS. If you decide to go with the double integer version of the latitude, longitude, and altitude data, there's an implied decimal point in there. Remember, this is integer data or double integer data to be more exact and there's an implied decimal point. So if you're talking about latitude and longitude, that implied decimal point is seven digits on the right of the decimal point. If you're talking about altitude, that implied decimal point is five digits to the right of the decimal point. Okay, let's talk about the word swapping that we need to do. All right, so let's talk first as if we're going to swap words in logic. Okay, so in other words, what we're going to do, and I've got the process kind of shown left to right there, is we're going to start by creating a Modbus variable array as an integer, which is something we would typically do when we're reading Modbus data. Okay. And in the case of my example, I have a total of 26 words we're going to be reading from the GPS module in my case. So I'm creating a variable array integer type with a size of 26 or a dimension of 26. And furthermore, I'm gonna map that array to a fixed memory location somewhere in the percent R memory table. And I've chosen to put that at R10,001 to make it easy to memorize as well as to put it up out of the way of things. Okay, then we're gonna to go to the Modbus scanner to configure it. And we're gonna configure everything as if we're just reading integer-based data and all the data that we're reading in is gonna get stored in the local Modbus holding register array that I previously created. Next, we're going to create a series of variables in the program variable window. And these variables will either be of the double integer or of the real type, depending on you know, where they're at in the map. And these variables are gonna to correspond to the latitude, the longitude, the altitude, etc. But we're gonna name them such that we can remember the fact that these variables that we're creating here 
are reversed in terms of their words. So as you can see, the names I'm using has the text of REV in the middle there, so I can keep track of the fact that these are latitude and longitude, for instance, but they're reversed. And then we're gonna memory map those to the appropriate location in memory that corresponds to where they fill in in that Modbus holding register array. So the Modbus holding register array starts at R10,001. Latitude is the first thing we're reading in as a double integer. So we're gonna map that to the same location. Longitude's the next thing we're reading in as a double integer. We're gonna map that to 10,003 and on, so on and so forth on down the line. However, remember those variables we've just created are reversed. So to create our final variables for latitude, longitude, etc., we need to create some logic that's gonna swap those words. And I'm showing it there on the screen. We have one rung of logic per variable that effectively takes that reversed double integer or the reversed real value. It moves or shifts up by 16 spaces to create a new high word that we store away. It shifts down or shifts right by 16 spaces, that original swapped data to create a new low word. And then the high word and the low word that we've just stored away earlier in the rung, we're gonna or those together to create our new variable that has the words in the proper order. So that's what it looks like if we take this approach. All right, so next let's go to Seascape and let's take a look at what this demo program looks like and what the Modbus scanner configuration looks like. Okay, so I'm starting with this ladder swap program here. Let's start by taking a look at the fact I've created this array. And in my case, it has a dimension of 26 from zero to 25 because I'm gonna be reading in a total of 13 double integer variables in the end, but I'm reading them in, in this example, as 26 integers to start with. And I've mapped it at R10,001. And then if we go take a look at the Modbus scanner configuration, uh, I'm gonna to go to hardware configuration, serial ports, MJ2. Let's start on the network side of things. This is where we configure 19200 N81 Modbus RTU as our normal Modbus serial parameters for the GPS. I have shortened all my timeouts and my reacquire times down to one second. So because there's really no reason for the OCS to ever wait longer than a second for the GPS to respond. The other thing I've done is I've set the update interval to one second. So in other words, the OCS is going to be polling the GPS every second to get its data. Now, the only reason I might wanna do that differently is if I have an application where my device is moving and I'm interested in getting the direction data as well as the speed data faster than every second. If that's the case, then I would probably change this 1000 to a zero and then we would pull as fast as we can. But I'm perfectly happy with a non-moving application for a one second interval. And then I've taken advantage of the fact we can do a disable on Modbus. We also can monitor status on Modbus to make sure everything's working properly. And I've incorporated that into my demo and you should always incorporate that into your application. So this is on the network level of configuration. And then we're gonna go to the device level of configuration. This is where we tell the OCS about the slave device that we're gonna be talking to. We give it a convenient name, I've called it GPS. We plug in the Modbus ID, which has a default of one for the banner GPS. And then we're leaving everything else pretty much as default with Modbus five digit addressing and not doing anything special on the Modbus function codes. And then we have taken advantage of creating a variable to be able to disable the GPS if we want to, although I don't see that being used very frequently. And we have taken advantage of GPS status or status on the slave to create a array of two integer variables that we can use for status. So that's the device level for this example, all right? Finally, we have our scan list. And in this example, we're creating our scan list such that we're reading all the data in as 16-bit integers. Okay, so we're not selecting this checkbox. Our length is based on words. And we're starting with, in this case, because of this specific device, we're starting with uh, Modbus holding register 40,001. 
and we're reading back 10 words, and we're storing those in that Modbus holding register integer array as a polled read. And the first 10 words are the double integer style data. The next 10 words configured exactly the same with different starting points and different destinations is the real type GPS data. And then the final uh, six words, if you will, is the quality data such as, you know, what is the signal quality? How many satellites are we uh, synchronized with? Those sorts of things. Again, with just a difference in terms of the Modbus register and the destination. Okay, so that's our configuration for uh, doing the logic or doing the swapping in logic, but we haven't done any swapping yet of any words. So let's take a look at how we finish the job. Okay, so I say okay everywhere here. All right, so the next step is remember all our data is being read into this array, which is mapped to 10,001. The next step is to create all these different variables for the reversed data for latitude, longitude, altitude, time, and date. That's the double integer form. We create variables for the same data, but in floating point form. Now in your application, you're gonna pick one or the other. You're either gonna grab double integer data or you're gonna grab real data. You're not gonna grab both. Most of you will probably grab real data because it's more convenient. And then finally, the last three variables that we're pulling are double integers. And those are the that's the quality data I've talked about. And you'll notice that we've mapped each of these to the appropriate location that's in the range of 10,001 to 10,026, depending on where they fall in the Modbus polling list. So now we have these reversed variables created. And then finally, the last step is we have some logic. Let's take a look at a logic routine here that I created. We have some logic, which basically is taking these reversed variables, doing a shift left, a shift right, and an OR command to create the final variables for latitude, longitude, altitude, GPS, time and date, etc., in the double integer form, as well as the floating point form. And then finally, uh, here's the floating point form. And then finally, the three quality uh, variables here. Okay, so that's what we did to do the actual word swapping. We actually did it in logic. All right, and then from the standpoint of the screens that were created, uh, let's take a look at those. We created a screen that had the latitude, longitude, altitude, time, and date information in double integer format, the same information, but in real format. Okay, the only way you can really tell the difference is by double clicking here, seeing we went sign decimal 32 bit. So that's the sign double integer value. Remember we have for, out, or for latitude and longitude, we have seven digits behind the decimal point. It's an implied decimal point. So we put that in the right location. And then for altitude, we have five digits behind the decimal point. So we set that properly. Okay. And then for time and date, there are no digits after the decimal point. It's basically just going to be six digits of time and then six digits of date. All right. Again, in the sign double integer format. And then if we take a look at the floating point, again, we're going to um, effectively decide how we want to display the data with how many decimal points and that sort of thing, but it's in real floating point format uh, for those particular variables. Now, in addition to just kind of the GPS data screen here, I've also created a Modbus diagnostic screen where we can make sure that we have good messages counting up every second as we're communicating with the GPS. If it ever takes us longer than one second to pull the GPS, then we'll get values counting up here, but I don't expect that very frequently. And if we ever have no responses or bad responses, those would count up here. And again, I'm hoping for very low numbers or even zeros in both of this status here. And then I've got a couple of toggle switches for disabling Modbus in general. The only way you would probably do that is if you're having communication problems and you just wanted to kind of do a Modbus reset, you could temporarily disable it and then re-enable it. And then disable the GPS, you would only turn that on if you literally wanted to disable the GPS while you're still talking to other devices on the network. But we've only configured one device, so we probably wouldn't use that very frequently either. And then finally, I created another screen to display that quality data I've talked about, signal quality, number of satellites that are being tracked, and the time since our last update. So those are the three screens that I created. So that's the approach that I'm taking 
based on doing the word swapping in logic. All right, let's go back and talk about another approach we can take to do word swapping. And that is doing that data manipulation right in the Modbus scanner itself and not having to do anything in logic to actually swap those words around so they're properly interpreted. So let's take a look at the approach that I've outlined on the screen here with this way of doing the word swapping. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create another Modbus variable array, but this time it's going to be a 32-bit array or a double integer array. So normally, anytime we do Modbus communications, we almost always create an integer array for holding registers and input registers. This time we're creating a double integer array because the data we're reading in is ultimately double integer and Seascape has this capability. So again, the dimension is going to be 26 words long, but it's only 13 in terms of a 32-bit array. So I've named the array, as you can see on the screen, I've given it a dimension of 13 double words, and it's still gonna be mapped, and I'm still deciding to map it to percent %R10001, but it's still 26 words of data. So it's being mapped from R10001 to R10026. Okay, the next step is in our Modbus scanner configuration. We're gonna read all the GPS data in this time as 32-bit data instead of 16-bit data. So there's an extra checkbox that we have on our configuration there in our scan list and our length for all of our data that we're reading is in terms of double words. So when we read in five double words, which would be 10 single words, our length is five if we're reading them at, reading them in as 32-bit variables. And then we have a swap check mark that we can make in the Modbus device dialog for the GPS that will cause us to actually swap those two words as we're reading them in as 32-bit values, all right? And then the final step is just to create the appropriate double integer and floating point variables mapped to the proper location in the, in the percent R memory table. So it corresponds to that variable array we created in the first step so that magically the data just shows up in those right variables because it's mapped to the same locations as that Modbus variable array. Okay, so let's head back to Seascape now, and then let's go ahead and minimize this program, and let's take a look at the program we have for doing the swapping in Modbus. All right, so we start with creating that 32-bit variable array. Let me go and expand this a bit here. So there it is, Modbus holding registers 32-bit is what I've named it. It's double integers and it's 13 double integers long. Now, we're reading in a mixture of double integer and floating point data. So you might be concerned that we need one array that is in double integer format, another one in the floating point format. We do not. So we can get by with just a double integer array for reading in Modbus data 32 bits at a time, regardless of whether the data needs to be interpreted ultimately as double integer, unsigned double integer, or real or floating point values, okay? So a double integer, a single double integer array will suffice. Again, a dimension of 13 for 13 double words. Again, mapped at the same location starting at R10001. All right, now let's take a look at the Modbus scanner. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and select serial ports here. Now, there's no changes on the network level, okay? And let's start on the scan list level and then go back to devices. Okay, so let's go to the scan list level and compare how our scan list is different this time. And the way it's different is this. We still have the same starting registers, that hasn't changed, but we've selected 32-bit access here and our length is now based on double words, not single words. So we're reading in 10 words as five double words, and our length is five because we express it in double words. And then again, we're copying or storing the data that we read in over Modbus to that 32-bit integer array, or 32-bit array that we just created in the previous step, okay? And so that is what we're doing for each of these three entries. Again, same starting point, but five double words instead of 10 single words, 32-bit access, and then the final one is three double words. Again, that has the diagnostic and quality information there. Okay, so that's what our 
That's what our scan list looks like. And then the last important step to make sure that we've accomplished is in the devices level, make sure that we've checked swap words on 32-bit data so that as that 32-bit data is read in in the scan list step, that we swap those words before we store it away in our Modbus 32-bit array. Okay, so that's what it looks like on doing the swap in Modbus. I think most of you would say, hey, I like the Modbus swap better because there's less variables to create. And again, the last step that I need to make sure I don't forget here is create those final variables for latitude, longitude, altitude, et cetera, and map them into the appropriate location within that Modbus array so that the data magically shows up in the appropriate variable. Now, from a screen standpoint, none of that's changed. I created the same screens with the same information that I showed you before with the ladder swap, and that all has been done in exactly the same fashion with exactly the same screens. Okay, the last thing I wanna show you is the equipment in action. So I installed a control panel with an OCS and the GPS module in my backyard earlier this week. Let's take a look at it now. Okay, so here we've got an outdoor enclosure that I use for the demonstration. And you can see the GPS unit is mounted to the top of the enclosure so it has access to the sky. Now you'll also notice I did not seal the hole in the panel for the ingress of that cable, which is definitely not something that I would do for a permanent installation. So you'll see some shortcuts I took for this kind of down and dirty installation, which are not what you would do for a permanent installation. Okay, so there we go. Now you can see the inside of the panel uh, we've got the GPS mounted there at the top. Now, another thing I didn't do is I didn't cut the cable to length. I just kind of coiled up the cable with the M12 connector there, you know, and affixed it to the side of the panel, as you can see there. I also attached kind of a breakout cable that takes the M12 connection, breaks it out into flying leads. And then all the connections between the OCS and the GPS are made there to interposing terminals. And then I've also um, got a DC power supply supplying both the GPS as well as the OCS, of course. Uh, and then next you've got the RS-45 connection, which is connected to MJ2 there. Uh, and again, those connections are made back at the interposing terminal strip again. And then the final cable that I have is just an ethernet cable there. So I can connect my computer here in the lab uh, with the panel that's outdoor. So I went ahead and ran a wired ethernet cable for that. So that's a look inside of the panel just for this down and dirty installation. A few things, of course, I would clean up for a actual installation. Um, now let's take a look at the demonstration here. So here's a unit with real data. And you can see we've got all of our latitude, longitude, altitude data. Um, we can go to the diagnostic screen and there we can see that, yep, we've got good messages counting up and all the bad diagnostics are staying near zero, which is what we want. And then again, we can also take a look at some additional diagnostics from the GPS unit. And that's showing us that we've got a signal level of one. And more importantly, we have eight satellites that we're connected to at this particular time, which means we're probably getting really good data. And if you take a look at all of the data on this screen, you'll notice that it's rock steady. So if we were synchronized with fewer satellites. Some of that data would be drifting around a bit and the quality of the data just wouldn't be there. But with eight satellites, it's rock solid. So we've got really good data that we're looking at here because we've got a really good signal with the sky. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the solar shield that we use on our outside applications when we demonstrate here in the channel, this is a unit from Rob Roy. Uh, that you can use that is really handy. It protects the OCS completely when it's not in use. And then you can also use it, as you can see here, as kind of a shield to keep the direct sunlight off the display when you're trying to read it, you know, when you do go to the site. And then, of course, you can close things back up again um, nice and tight. So, yeah, once again, that is the solar shield from Rob Roy. Okay, so that wraps up the demonstration of the equipment and it wraps up all the material I wanted to share with you today. All right, so let's talk about the fact that the Banner GPS is a very useful accessory in a variety of applications. 
whether you're looking to get position, a GPS position of the equipment that you have deployed all over the country, or whether you're looking to synchronize time between equipment that's deployed maybe thousands of miles apart so that the data logs will effectively be synchronized and you can compare the performance of the machines side by side, for instance. And the connection between the Banner GPS and the Horner OCS, unlike some other GPS units, which might be an NMEA format, Banner happens to use Modbus format, so that's what we demonstrated for you today. Okay, this is the portion of the program where I remind you that we're here every Tuesday at 2 o'clock, whether we're totally live like we were today, or whether we are pre-recorded. But in either case, we have people standing by, today it was Casey Gardner, to answer any questions you have. And for those of you who watch on replay, you can always give us your questions and comments in the comment section and we'll get back to you just as soon as we can. And we are celebrating 10 years of the Horner Lighting Group. You'll find lots of great Horner Lighting videos, including a new one that went up this week, alongside our great automation content. Now, don't forget, sign up for training. We have two courses coming up in the near term. We have advanced training, August 8th through 9th, and we have IEC training, September 13th and 14th. So sign up for those courses before they get full. Now, August, when we're, we're to August now, this was the last uh, live stream in July, August is IEC month. So I believe we have five Tuesdays in August, which means five IEC related topics. And the first one we're gonna get to is we're gonna show you all the details in creating user-defined function blocks in Seascape's IEC logic editor. Now it's similar to, but not exactly the same as what we do with variable based advanced ladder. So we thought it was important to present that material to you next week. And remember, we have five straight IEC related topics coming up in August. Okay, for those of you who have not subscribed to our channel yet, don't hesitate to do so. It doesn't cost anything. And if you choose notifications when you subscribe, you'll be notified every time we go live or every time we post a new video. And remember, we posted a new video on lighting this week you'll wanna check that out in addition to all the great automation content. Okay, so until next week, until we start IEC month in August, let's all get out there and do us some good.